Welcome everyone to this Thursday's Matter talk. I'm Allison and I'll be your host for today. Thursday's Matter is a virtual meetup welcoming experts from around the globe to explore a wide range of topics on that, that touch on software development and the tech industry as a whole. Today's edition is presented by Jose Huerta. Jose R. Huerta is the MD for Coder in Spain. He leads and supports a team of exceptional people whose purpose is to accelerate organizations and to help them reach their goals. He has helped the likes of IBM, Kaicha Bank, Isade, Wallapop, and others to evolve towards more effective and collaborative ways of working across their teams. To read some of his thoughts, please check out the link I am posting in the chat. Today's session is also co-organized by Codurance. Codurance is a global software consultancy funded on software craftsmanship and agile principles. They deliver valuable quality software for their clients and help them, and help them sustain better ways of working through skills transfer and positive cultural change. Codurance has also built a free to use tool called the Compass, which assesses the maturity of your software development organization and provides a report with recommendations for improvement. Before we begin, I'd like to run through a few quick housekeeping items. First, you can find out more about today's talk and our speaker in the link I've added to the event chat feature in this webinar. As this talk is being recorded, the video of the talk will be found also on this page tomorrow. Feel free to use this event chat feature on the right panel of your screen to leave any comments and learning points, or perhaps just share a little about where you're joining us from today. Should you have any questions on the content of Jose's talk, however, please place these in the stage chat feature. These questions will be reviewed throughout the talk and Jose will aim to answer them at the end of the session. Only the questions added to the stage chat will be considered. We'll be posting a feedback poll, just one quick question following the session and would really appreciate your input there as well. You can find the polls in the right side panel of your page just to the right of the chat function. Finally, Skills Matter is proud to be a part of an inclusive and welcoming community, and we do have a code of conduct in place. I will add this to the event chat as well. Please bear it in mind when contributing to the chat and Q&A features of this webinar. And without further ado, we are delighted to introduce Jose Huerta, who will show us the death of silos. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. So let's start then with a bit of engagement, right? So answer on the event chat. Have you ever been a victim of poor collaboration? If you've had a bad experience, either customer service, you know, engaging with a company, maybe working on a project uh, and well, it, it has affected you. About 12 years ago, uh, I moved to the flat where I live now. And I wanted to bring with me both the internet provider service that I had and uh, the new, uh, well, the, the, the same number that I had on my phone line. And maybe I was young and naive, but I thought it was gonna be an easy process. Instead, I embarked on my own odyssey. Uh, it was a sea of you know departments that don't talk to each other, um, uh, misinformation, uh, blaming, uh, all on and on. It took about a month and I still didn't get what I wanted, which was I wanted internet at home, right? So I had to uh, leave that service provider because they showed me they, they couldn't do a proper job um, and uh, start with a new one. And surprise, surprise, I got that done in about a week time. So never again, right? However, this is not a, a an exception. Like lots of people have these problems, you know, either as a client or working on projects, right? And for 
for part of it is like we have this idea that organizations that are a team, right, are a football team where everyone plays their own position and, you know, everyone's focused on winning the game and, you know, the goalie is doing one thing and the defense is another one and, and all in all they, they, they coordinate in order to achieve success, right? However, we know that's not the, the case. A lot of these organizations or a lot of organizations, are, they're playing football more like this, right? In the middle of the field, there's a couple of tents and uh, the players are in there. And their uh, mission is as soon as someone, you know, as the ball comes through this you know, door, we need to kick it out as fast as possible, right? Uh, and this is in part due to optimization. This is in part due to, you know, hierarchies, etc. But the truth is we end up with, you know, silos with these divisions where you know tens are blaming each other or they are letting opportunities escape because they're simply not in anyone's court right so the idea of today's talk is you know in uh, the world if you want you know, that success, most of the time, we've gotten really good at optimizing functions, right? Like specific areas of our organization uh, do their work very well, right? Either at the software level or process level, wherever you look at it. However, uh, most of the opportunities are in between those functions. Most of the opportunities are, a, you know, sort of like in no one's domain. Like in my case, no, when I was uh, moving uh, moving uh, to a new location, right? So today what I would like to do is to go over how we address some of these topics and in particular, what can you do? What is the origin of this and, and how to manage it in order not, for it not to affect your organization the same way and give you a competitive edge? I'm Jose. Um, I'm an organizational consultant at MD at uh, Cadurance, and part of what we do is precisely help our clients to go through some of these uh, changes or transformations because a lot of the times it's not about the technology, a lot of the times it's not about the tools or the processes, it's about people and how people collaborate and whether you make that easy or not, right? So. The topic of silos is, is kind of a very interesting to me because I, I really believe that silos are a bit like Gizmo from the Gremlins. I don't know if you've seen the movie, right? It is this cute animal, right, that someone receives as a gift. But then there's a couple of caveats attached to it, right? Like if you um, get him wet, he starts reproducing. and You get all of these clones of Gizmo that are not as good as Gizmo. Um, and if you feed them after midnight, they turn into these beasts that create, you know, chaos all over the place, right? This is a, the state where a lot of these organizations or, or a lot of organizations are in right now, where they have created these silos that have allowed them to grow and to expand. And now it's really hard to go back to the nice little fellow that, that would help, right, instead of creating issues. So... What are the symptoms, right? Like the, the first thing is how do we know that we are in the presence of, you know, silos? Well, it's pretty easy, no? Let's, let's do a bit of a show of hands. If you can recognize any of these within your organization, go ahead and comment on the chat. Most of us have seen some of these, right? either day to day, either, uh, you know, when we engage with other organizations, right? Uh, we recently signed, you know, a, a government contract. Most of those were present, yeah? So these symptoms or this, you know, idea that the, this negative uh, outcomes that silos create are present everywhere, we are able to see them frequently. If you look in detail, you can probably group them into four uh, main areas, right? Or four, let's say, group of issues, right? And uh, they tend to be very simple, right? Like either people don't ask for help, 
uh, you know, they either have you know, the belief that they should solve their own problems, uh, you know, like they either don't want to um, um, reveal that there's an issue or something like that, right? Uh, or they're hoarding, right? Or uh, this is due to maybe competitiveness, right? Between or uh, uh, people feeling like if they share information, if they help others, maybe uh, they'll lose power. Um, size definitely has to do with it. The bigger the organization, uh, you know, the harder it is to find the people that you need within the organization and even uh, figure out which information it is that you need because you have, you know, the bigger the, the organization, the bigger, you know, the amount of information you have. Plus, all of the um, inconveniences, to say, of maybe not knowing people and, and not being able to transfer that information or that knowledge, right? Which we usually found uh, in, in organizations when, uh, for instance, there are people who are uh, very specialized in a specific domain, right? It's not easy to get all of that experience that is there, it's tacit knowledge, right? Uh, and to turn it into you know, something that other people can reuse within the organization. Right. So we've seen some of the symptoms. We know how to recognize it, but how do silos, silos form? Yeah. Well, let's start with your organization. Yeah. On paper, your organization looks something like this. Right. You have a hierarchy. You have processes. No, you have uh, your know, responsibilities. All of this. But is this the only? part of your organization? The answer is no, of course not. You have many different structures. There are lots of other relationships that are not depicted in hierarchy diagrams, right? There is the value creation structure where, you know, people who maybe belong to different parts of the organization or functions need to cooperate in order to deliver value. You have the informal structure, like uh, Peter and, and John went to school together, uh, Jill is married to uh, Tom, et cetera, right? Like that kind of you know, uh, relationship that exists, not only from working, but also from, from previous experience. And the idea is that all of these things, the culture behind it, et cetera, is what really is your organization. There is more to it than just the processes, responsibilities, et cetera, right? Now, your organization is under pressure of certain forces, right? And today we're going to talk about some of those. Uh, but the idea is that those forces are trying to push and shape your organization in a, in a different way. Yeah. And by doing that, they are sort of creating those problems that we saw before, right? What are some of those forces? Well, some of them are very useful. No, optimization, we already mentioned some of that. Now we create departments, functions, roles, responses, all of that because we want to optimize. Yeah. Uh, others are related to physical location. So if we're in London or if we're in uh, Barcelona or whatever, that, that creates a, also a gap, yeah, culturally and, and many other ways. Yeah. Uh, of course, the culture. No, the, the particular culture, even within one location, you can have different cultures like marketing versus you know, uh, sales versus uh, technology, et cetera, finance. You know? And of course, there's the human aspect of the, all of that, right? Our biases, how we interpret the world, et cetera. Et cetera. Let's look at some of those uh, in detail to see what, I'm, uh, what I mean. Let's, let's start with optimization, which is a concept that, you know, quite old, no? Uh, uh, industrial revolution, we're trying to go into you know, mass production, we're trying to reduce cost, uh, optimize, right? Uh, moving from a model where we had craft people, uh, people who usually took years to train, who were very few, uh, highly paid, highly skilled, no? And we, we take the work that they're doing and we try to break it down into tasks, no? and sort of like become, um, turn it into something that you could, for instance, in an assembly line uh, kind of uh, produce, right? And then that allows us to hire less, let's say, skilled people, no? uh, lower salaries, scale up, et cetera, but 
uh, you know, you no longer have that visibility of the whole process, right? You no longer have that skill set that's required to understand a, a, a bunch of the interconnections between things, right? So this is one of those uh, forces that is constantly. Does this mean it's bad to optimize? Not at all, right? The problem is, again, when we don't manage the, that optimization, then it, it starts becoming a problem, right? You have UX and uh, you have a, a developer and you have, that's in itself is not bad, right? Uh, you need that specialization. And then uh, there's also a lot of research around how a physical location affects you know, communication and collaboration in general, right? And one of the, the most known is the, what we call the, the Allen curve, right? In the 70s, uh, an MIT professor run a study, you know, trying to figure out what was the relationship between the distance at which people, you know, were located and how often they communicated, right? It's, it's a study that was run also again uh, around 2000 or so, thinking that maybe uh, uh, having email or WhatsApp and all these things would change the result. And curiously, the outcome of that was that it didn't change because it turns out that you're more likely to communicate with the people that you, you're you close to, right, than uh, through email, uh, WhatsApp, et cetera, than people that, you know, you don't have much relationship with on your day-to-day, -day, let's say, right? So, um, so f physical location definitely impedes a lot of these, right? Like if you're a consultancy and you're working on a client, it's not the same as when you're working from the office, right? If you're uh, a company that has offices in different uh, continents, it's not the same, no? Uh, from one uh, office to the next, right? They all uh, affect uh, that collaboration. Then on the cultural side, we have a... I guess the, the best way to illustrate this is, is using something called the competing values framework, right? And basically what the competing values framework is, is a theory that allows you to uh, analyze organizational phenomena, right? Uh, based on where they lay on, uh, let's say two aspects are that are key for uh, organizational effectiveness, which are, you know, how uh, externally or internally focused something is versus how flexible or let's say constrained restricted control something is right and as you see this in, in this graph like it it already tells you a bit no that uh you know when you're talking about uh, let's say a marketing department right it, it will be something much more you know towards the external factor, no, uh, looking at the market, looking at, you know, the client, what do we need, what do we need to create, uh, or what kind of processes do we have, sales generation, lead scoring, all of that stuff, right? Versus, you know, the, the, versus the, the client's always right versus, you know, what about my team, right? What about the people that, uh, that I have that are part of that and need to fulfill the service that we're providing, et cetera, right? or how creative they can be, right? So all of these values are competing with each other and depending on, uh, on what you want for your organization or, or how your strategy is set up, yeah? Maybe having a very competitive thing is, is what you need, maybe not. Maybe you need more than one uh, culture living within your organization, but you also need them to be able to talk to each other, right? You also need for them to collaborate together. However, those things are there, right? That, that those forces are pulling them apart, especially between the quadrants that are opposed that are opposed to each other. Yeah. And another one that I find really interesting, and this is the last one we're going to look at, is uh, the classification system. So, if you look at it from an anthropological point of view, every society has a classification system. It's a way of understanding the world, right? The labels we put on things allow us to you know, convey ideas and, huh? and uh, this already creates uh, classes. It's a simplification, but at the same time allows us to cope with all that information. No? 
The problem with this is that when you use these labels, and this is something that you need, right? This is something that you need to do. When you use these labels, you're not only creating one classification. Right? You're not only saying, oh, developers. No, you're creating the group of the developers, but you're also creating the group of the non-developers. You're creating the group of you know, sales or business versus the group of technology or non-technology, right? So the language that we use also influences how uh, we are constructing these barriers and how we are enabling uh, these forces to, to affect how the organization works. One good example of this, and I know I'm, I'm using lots of examples from uh, software development because we do a lot of that, but it, it, it happens everywhere, right? Uh, is the QA function, right? Where suddenly the minute that you say, you know, we have a QA, yeah, then quality is not my issue, right? There's the QAs who take care of quality, right? And then everyone else who doesn't take care of quality. We, in the end, goes against what you're trying to achieve with the organization in general. Yeah, just to give an example. Okay, so as I mentioned before, the idea is that the organization is under these forces and it is constantly being pulled apart. It's being pulled apart because those forces, most of the time, are not aligned. And that is what starts creating those silos, uh, those silos, right? So how do we get rid of them? How do we get, get a torch and, you know, go and burn them down? You know, the seals are bad. Uh, you know, no, that's, that's, not the, that's not the point. As I mentioned before, like, silos are here to stay, right? Because the forces that are creating them are not going to go away, right? If you're a company you, and the market is asking for something or is pulling you in one direction, there's no way to avoid that. Right, that's part of you know being a company, right, and being able to deliver value to your clients, right. And if you want to do that, then you also need people and talent, and you need to take care of them and that kind of stuff. So you will always have these uh, forces in different directions. However, just like I don't know gravity, right, you can use it. You can use it to fly, right. You can use it if you understand what they are. If you understand. Uh, how they fit together, how they act on each other, you can use them to harness that energy uh, within the organization and, uh, and basically make it work you know, uh, for you in a more effective and a more collaborative uh, way. So what can we do, right? Like how do we harness that, let's say, energy, you know, in a sense? Uh, well, we, we know a lot about what doesn't work. Right, and this is something that you've probably seen uh, out there. Right, there's three things that people tend to uh, use a lot. You know, one is uh, the whole bonuses or incentives. Yeah, point of view. Like, if I give you know the team uh, a bonus at the end of the year, they will do the no. Or if I you know give the salesperson, uh, that will you know, get them working on that on the direction I want. You know, for instance. Uh, another one is, you know, collocating or restructuring things, right? Let's talk a little bit about why those things don't tend to work very well. Yeah. Let's start with incentives and motivation. Some of you might know uh, this, this person here on screen, Daniel Pink, has a book called Drive, uh, where he talks about, you know, what the state of the art is on the research on motivation. Right. He talks about something called extrinsic motivators, things like bonuses, the typical carrot and stick kind of philosophy of, of motivating people, and then intrinsic motivators, things like mastery, purpose, autonomy. Right. They come from within. They're not an external thing that people want. Right. So when you start using bonuses, when you start using, uh, you know, incentives, you know, quid pro quo kind of, uh, what tends to happen is that you kill that motivation for uh, that intrinsic motivation, that mastery, that, that I'm doing things not because I'm, I'm going to get a bigger check, 
but because I like doing it and I like ve getting better at it and I like, you know, growing as a professional, as a human being, that kind of stuff. So in general, when you try to use those kinds of systems, uh, you're uh, going against having a healthy culture and having uh, a bunch of the things that in, in, in the first place you were trying to get, right? That collaboration, right? One example was competitiveness I, I gave before, no? Um, well, if you put a lot of pressure on people in order to deliver, yeah, uh, that means that if someone comes and says, hey, I need help, that is seen as, okay, and now I have to do a trade-off. Now I have to either achieve my objective, which is what I'm being measured for. This is what I'm, you know, what I, uh, uh, the, the, the care that I need to get versus helping someone else, right? To get, you know, something done that maybe they, they don't, they can't do without you. Right? Or maybe it's more important than what you have to do, but you don't know it, right? So those are the kind of challenges behind using incentives in, in this way. They don't also don't work very well when it comes to knowledge work. Uh, they tend to narrow the narrow the focus and you know diminish creativity. And in today's world, you know, a lot of the work that we do, at least in software development and, and other industries, is about knowledge. Right? It's about a uh, creativity and being able to come up with solutions. It's not just, you know, pushing a lever, uh, a lever, right? Then the other two is about location and structure, right? Uh, and I've seen this happen, right? Like I've seen, uh, we need to collaborate more. Let's, let's, uh, from, from tomorrow, we're going to be, you know, cross-functional teams because that's that's the thing. That's how you get people to collaborate, right? And we're going to have uh, someone from uh, finance, uh, someone from marketing, someone from sales, someone from uh, technology, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and we're going to put them all together. We're going to sit them together at the, at the same table. Does that create collaboration? Well, on its own, definitely not, right? Uh, but is this kind of thinking that makes it um, not work? Is the idea that we tend to go for the solutions that are easy to implement because you know the easy thing is to draw a new diagram, the easy thing is to draw a new process, and then you know do a presentation, and now from now on you know everything is going to be uh, perfect. That doesn't work like that because you have all of that learned behavior, you have all of those relationships, you have all of those things that, that I talked about before that are not being addressed when you're trying to evolve that, right? So it needs to be seen as a, uh, not as a process or a, 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 um, a change, a one-time change, but an evolution of the organization more than anything, right? Now, if that doesn't work and we know, yeah, or at least they don't work on their own, yeah, uh, what can we do? What, what is it that we can do that actually is being proven to work? And so there, for me, there are two things. The first thing is blurring the borders of those silos or functions, if you want to call them, yeah, or domains or whatever you want to call it. Um, blurring them, but not making them disappear. Right. What do I mean by blurring them? Well, before you had, you know, very clear distinction between what IT takes care of and then sales, but the opportunities were in the middle. Uh, you need to be explicit about that blurness. Right. It's not crystal clear anymore. Right. And this is what some uh, structures like imp implementing things like racing matrixes or uh, um, or uh, matrix, uh, you know, matrix organizations, that kind of stuff, uh, is trying to do right. Like they, they're trying to somehow blur those borders, trying to make it so that people need to make decisions, informed decisions, to get a better outcome instead of just sticking to, you know, this is your uh, lane, no, uh, so to speak, or uh, this is your uh, responsibility. Now, what can we do to implement those? Because it's easier said than done. No? Uh, here are some examples that we've used successfully in the past, right? Um, first, you know, data. We, we use the example of a football team. It's very hard to play football if you don't know where everyone else is, if you don't know where the ball is. So data is sort of that, right? Is, a, is that feedback loop in order to help people make better decisions. Uh, Systemic thinking, like I am not just my job, I'm not just the, the part of the assembly line, the, but also 
the relationships of my job or, or what I do with the rest of the organization, how everything fits together. Yeah. We talked about making explicit uh, what that blurring is through tools like the racing metrics uh, for uh, for management or things like that. Um, building up the networks within the organization, the uh, informal structures that we talked about. We will we'll give some examples on that. And of course, a, adopt structures that a sort of facilitate or encourage that systemic view, right? If you uh, if your if your structure is siloed, uh, that doesn't encourage much, right? If you have a matrix, then you know at least you get some visibility. Yeah. If you have things like a uh, holocracy or sociocracy that you uh, use patterns where in order to get things done, you actually need to involve people that will be affected and that kind of stuff, then it becomes a bit easier because within the system, you're already looking out for those things to happen, for that collaboration and that consideration, at least of, of the needs and the drivers of others to, to happen. Right. So all of these tools uh, can help with that. So with data, one simple example is, uh, you know, do people know if things are going well or not? You know, either financially, either you know, deployments. How many deployments are we doing per um, you know per day? What's what's your uh, what is the failure rate for that? Every time that we do, how many mistakes or, or uh, errors or failures do we get? How long do we take to? Um, uh, know or, or fix, let's say, things that get all the way to production. What is the time, the total time? When so, when a customer asks me for something, how long do we take uh, until it's done? Right? When some, when a department asks for a feature, how long do we take uh, until it's in production? All those things, right? Uh, if you're looking at marketing or sales, you know, are the leads that I'm sending you actually uh, converting? Like, what is the feedback from this? Like, do we have a closed loop, or is it just, you know? I finish my quota, you know, next, and and that's it, right? So all of the things, data is a is a keystone aspect there, right? Then systemic thinking. I already mentioned this a little bit, but the idea is that when we are looking at silos in general, people from the silo don't see the silo, right? Like if you're in it, it's it's always everyone else who has the problem. Right, uh, so and that's a perspective that is that is uh, skewed, right? Like you're only seeing a little bit of of, uh, of the picture, right? So, uh, what can you do about that, right? You need to teach people to understand how decision making is impacted by those relationships, and and you need to uh, teach them that there's not only a, a linear cost effect relation that things are complicated that we live in a complex system and you know what i do now is going to create problems maybe down the line right i'm not going to see them immediately things like technical debt for instance right it seems like nothing's happening eventually you know you you do the quick fix you do the quick fix and then eventually you're not able to put things in production anymore because you know you need to refactor everything or you need to redo things or you need to throw away your system again and uh, and and start over right so this uh, systemic aspect is really important to in order to achieve that you need to focus on leadership because they tend to be the ones shaping uh, that culture and I and I'm talking leadership in the most general term not only people with authority but people who lead within the organization you know like uh, trend makers if you want to call it right or, or um, ambassadors of, of what the culture of the organization is yeah we talked about uh, racing matrices for those who don't know it's very simple you have set of tasks you have uh, roles and then you define for each a role, what is the level of involvement, let's say, within the task? It could be a council. It could be a you know, consultant. Hey, I'm going to do this. What do you think? What do you think is the best approach? What should I consider? Blah, blah. Or just inform. Hey, you know, I'm going to do this. Or, hey, I did this, right? which is not great. But, uh, but it, is, it already makes explicit, uh, especially for roles that uh, need to collaborate, that, you know, that collaboration needs to exist, and that is also part of the uh, role or responsibility. Right? The problem with these things is that the minute that you start, you know, narrowing down the focus, you're already making that that 
border of the silo crispy. No, it's like you're already making it, you know, very clear, uh, right? What's around that? So it's good as a tool to start having conversations and understanding what the end goal is, right? Like what winning the game is versus, you know, what is my responsibility or what my responsibility for the role is. We talk about uh, we talked about building informal structures. This is an aspect that um, that very few organizations uh, pay attention to. And today, for instance, with the whole COVID situation, is one of those that you know has suffered the most, right? Uh, and in order to be able to to do this. Uh, you need to, you know, design how to build those things, right? Uh, there are companies that, for instance, do it during the induction process, right? Like they take everyone together and uh, they put them together where they come from one place or another, uh, or they do boot camps. We do an academy, for instance, all that stuff. And through the academy, they're meeting people. They're, you know, creating those connections even before they start doing their job, right? But it's something that is essential because the minute that there's something that's not working within the system that you have or the processes that you have, these things not only allow you to get better information or communication, but also allow you to find, you know, those bottlenecks and overcome them, right? So you can call someone and find and say, hey, you know, like I'm having this issue. Like, what can you do for me? If you know them, if you don't know them, that's impossible and then you can go and fix the bottleneck right like then you can do you know try to adapt your system to, and improve it but uh without it you know you're you're sort of lost we talked about uh co-location and and the physical distance and this is something that um you know now that we're all at the same distance so to speak uh is key right uh and you can be working remotely and not have that space and that feeling of co-location, right? And it, they, this is an essential aspect of, of, uh, of this, right, of, of that collaboration. You want to build a team. They need to be together. They need to have time to gel no? and, and to uh, become a, a unit, et cetera. So uh, we've done lots of uh, things with this. You know, you can use Spragly. You can use a, a Zoom room and have it there all the time. People just connect, et cetera. Um, but when you, um, especially when you're in a context like this, it's impossible not to not to have this. You're going to suffer. People are going to suffer. Newcomers to the company are going to suffer. Yeah, because you know you get isolated. You don't. You know, every time that you speak to someone, you you speak to them about work, and uh, you know that the, all of these those things end up um, affecting. Now, the second point that I mentioned that it was very useful. It kind of evident. No, it's like, oh, you need to align those, you know, forces. You need to like, no, if if they're caused by misalignment, no, let's let's put them together and let's make them work for us. Yeah. However, it's not it's still very uh infrequent that you find uh this, right? Because the idea here is yes, you will have your functions and you have and they will have their own goals and objectives and things, but what you want is for them to be revolving around a central direction that you want to go to, a central strategy for the organization, for the department, whatever scale you're looking at and improving collaboration, right? And if you don't have that center point, everyone's just going to draft, go in their own direction. So you need, you know, a vision, purpose, a strategy, objectives, etc. But all of them need to be connected, right? Uh, and the reason why this uh, works is it's very interesting because it is related to identity yeah, and who we are. Okay, so let's let's take an example. So, who I am is a collection of things of, of concepts that I have sort of like appropriated or identified with me. Right? I know I'm Cuban. Uh, I'm a developer, or you know, like I studied here or there. Right? Like all of those things are part of who I am. Right now, everyone's got that, and and they all have you know different uh, preferences or, or levels, right? I may feel more like I'm uh, um, from a team, no, or uh, than a function, for instance, right? Like I'm more of a you know I'm team proxy, whatever the team A, right? Uh, versus I'm an Android developer or I'm a, a analyst, 
a business analyst, right? Now, when you give them an objective or when you give people an objective, a vision, a common enemy, right? What happens is that you allow them to connect at a level of identity, right? Uh, that is a, what actually creates that, uh, facilitates that alignment, yeah? The minute that you see yourself, now I'm giving an example of, you know, the walking dead, right? Like, doesn't matter where I come from, we all need to survive, right? <laughs> like, because we need to, we're now survivors, right? Like, we're now, we have more in common than the things that divide us, right? And strategy, goals, uh, purpose, all of these things allow for that to happen. It's really hard to connect at that level and create that sense of unity if you don't uh, if you don't have that you know goal or um, you know joint purpose uh, if you want to call it right. You can use several tools for this, right? Like uh, it's very common to hear you know OKR strategy maps, you know balance core cards, all this stuff. Like all of those tools are fine. They they help you with it and they allow you to make explicit what those are, find information, particularly this kind of information, which is kind of like, what are we trying to achieve, right? Like one of the things that OKR has is, you know, you're supposed to make them visible for the company, right? So people know, you know, what my team is working on, people know, and, and if they come, they can also adapt what they're doing to fit within, you know, what I'm trying to achieve with my team. So all of the things would allow you to uh, align those vectors. A lot of the time, those are not done. We are just trapped in the you know plan do kind of cycle without really thinking about what we want to do or, or even making a, giving a meaning as a group instead of you know individually. Right now, just to again the the main point of this is you know you need to fix that collaboration because it, the biggest opportunities you have nowadays are you know in between functions uh, and that is a competitive advantage it doesn't matter what you're doing if you're doing software that's great uh, if you're doing something else you will also need that right if you want to stay uh, competitive and uh, the option is not to wage a war against uh, silos. It's about understanding where those differences are coming from, where uh, those barriers are being created, handling them and, and managing them in order to work t for you, right? Um, and of course, you could do that you know, many ways. They're not going to disappear. This is not something that you're going to uh, get rid of immediately, right? Uh, but it's something that you can manage uh, slowly. In particular, if you use these two strategies that I mentioned before, some of the examples that I gave, uh, you can definitely uh, improve a lot more and you can see it a lot more, not only in the outcome of what you're trying to achieve, you know, process-wise or value delivered to clients-wise, um, but also people, right? Like people like to have a purpose. Right, like they do. It's, it's one of those uh, intrinsic motivators that we. So if I'm doing one thing and I don't see how that is affecting everything else, you know, eventually I'll I'll be demotivated also, right? So all of those things help each other and, and sort of like connected to each other. You can definitely uh, try it if you don't want to end up with gremlins in the kitchen, so to speak. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Jose. Well, it looks like we have a few minutes uh, to answer any questions. Again, please submit your questions so that Jose can answer them. We, we have a question on, uh, so is there any suggested next step or resources to point uh, to, to get started? Um, Yes, there are a few, right? So I already mentioned some of them, you know, if you're looking into incentive, motivation, that kind of stuff, Drive uh, or the talk by Daniel Payne, the TED talk about uh, about motivation. Uh, that's, a, that's a good place to start. There's also a book called The Silo Effect that uh, talks a little bit about this, and uh, you know, from from a different perspective. Uh, there's also a book called uh, Collaboration by um, by Morton Hansen, I think it's called, uh, from uh, Berkeley. Uh, where he explains a lot of the research is done on, on the collaboration uh, aspect of things. Um, 
yeah, I think that those would be good places to start. You can also look at the competing values framework. In particular, there's a there's a book by uh, Queen and the other author uh, of the of the method that talks about uh, shaping organizations using the competing values framework and and what competing values leadership looks like uh, and management what kind of skills you need to build if, to get certain types of uh, culture so all of those are um, good resources to start with I'm sure we can uh, post them with uh, later on uh, on Twitter or whatever happy to to give reference to those um, so uh, someone's talk, uh, someone's asking. So I think you mentioned the words uh, something like holacracy. Uh, those are different ways of organizing your company or your organization. Right? Holacracy and sociocracy. Uh, you should definitely take a look at them. Um, they share a lot of aspects, um, and they are you know they're they're. There's a topic here around teal organizations, which is a concept you know is being uh, brought up recently, as in you know the evolution of organizations and 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 so on, uh, from you know more uh, structured and rigid to you know something where you know it's the next level of organization. Say you know things focusing on purpose and self-organization and uh, autonomy and all these concepts, right? So. Sociocracy and holacracy, they try to uh, to work on, on those aspects, giving you a different model than the traditional model to, to be able to organize uh, teams, groups, and around work in general, right? In the case of sociocracy, it's quite prescriptive in, in the sense that it will, uh, one of the first things that it asks you to do is to create some sort of, um, what's the word in English? Uh, uh, statues, let's call it, for the organization that on how things should work. But what are the laws, let's say, of of holacracy? And then it allows you to change everything else as long as those are respected. You know, and that includes, you know, the redefining the role of a CEO and what kind of decisions it can make, for instance, right? And all of these sound scary, but there are lots of organizations. Well, now. A lot. It's not like super widespread, but there are uh, a few cases of, of people using this. Uh, and the case of sociocracy is a collection of patterns that work very well together and achieve a lot of the same things. Like, for instance, we are using patterns internally, like the uh, initiative circles, which is or driving uh, the organization uh, through uh, precisely needs or drivers, right? Uh, and reacting to those and how do you involve people? So all of these things are helpful if you're thinking of you know, starting to take steps in that direction. Just figure out, for instance, with sociocracy, what kind of patterns uh, already using some of them. You didn't know uh, how, you know, that they were a pattern. And you can see what else works well together with the patterns that you're already using. So that's a good way to, to move forward. There's also a book around that. I would also recommend the book, uh, Delivering Happiness uh, by Tony Che uh, from Sapos. Uh, uh, which is, which talks about a you know creating a, a culture that's really you know, surprising. Let's say, um, why do people form silos even in a team that has just eight devs? You will see division of front end, back end, and so on. Well, I I went through some of these. So there are a, so you could, there are many reasons for that to happen, and I'm sure they connect to some of these forces that we talked about. Right? Why do we organize in front end, back end? Is it because the structure, right? Someone already said, you know, you're going to be doing this and this is, you know, uh, we talked about optimization and, uh, you know, the assembly line and uh, all of those things. So it, that could be a reason, right? Uh, it could be, uh, you know, a motivation uh, issue. No, it's like, I don't want to learn front. I don't, this is not what I like to do or no, that, so I don't want to. So individually that could be, a, a reason. No, there's just plenty of other. It could be that I just don't know how to do it differently, right? Like this is how we work always, right? So I joined the company and I learned how they work in this company. So who am I to like rock the boat, right? And try to change things. I'm I'm the last one here, right? So all of those things could be. Um, uh, and again, I go back. It does. It's not about having everyone 
you know, there's things like, you know, XP, things like you have developers, right? You don't have QA, you have, because you're not trying to create those distinctions, right? It's not that everyone needs to do everything. Yeah, you still need that specialization. It's about how you make sure that even though you're having that specialization on, on a function, you are not, a, you know, a, a hindering collaboration between functions and, and you're not getting in the way of things. So a lot of that will really be contextual, depends on, on what you're trying to achieve, et cetera. Sometimes you can get around it, right? Uh, you have... Uh, there, there's certain hacks that you can do. For instance, if you're a bank, right? Uh, usually, um, there's a regulatory process in order to get stuff into production, right? Like it needs to go through a lot of checks, and people need to see it, and security, and compliance, and you no. Know? So, all those things still need to happen. There are needs that is the, in place because you know otherwise you don't have a business. So you need to work around some of those. Uh, uh, things that those divisions that are you know constraints right uh one way that uh, we've seen uh how to work around those things is you know i hire someone yeah, that comes learns in my department how we're doing things how we deploy how we you know like what are the things that we need and then uh, it's still paid by my budget for my department i send it to work under you know a different department i revoke all of his privilege I, et cetera, but they they're there, yeah, working for that other area, but they understand what we need and they work uh, basically to to serve uh, the needs of this area, right? So all of those are kind of workarounds that you could use, right? It's not a it's not a one size fits fits all, right? And it's also not bad to have specialization. It's just how uh, how much of that actually creates the silo and and how are you addressing uh, those things. Uh, another question was, how useful have you found the racing matrix? How often should they be updated? So I found it quite useful as a conversation tool. Okay. So you're not like, if your idea is we will write it down and then uh, someone will, uh, you know, when people come in, they'll just go and check this and they will know what to do and how everything works. That's not, I've never seen it work like that. Okay. Um, it can be useful in that regard, in, in giving that visibility, et cetera. But uh, for me, it's been more useful as a conversational uh, tool, like in order to trigger, you know, hey, we, we do need to collaborate. You can't make these decisions without me being involved because this is how they affect me, right? Let's, let's make it explicit that this is how it's going to happen, right? So as, uh, from that point of view, it, it helps in, in that regard, right? Uh, again, it's about making explicit how you want to work together. Right. Another example is, you know, what is a marketing qualified lead versus sales qualified lead versus, you know, it's like if you go to other areas of the organization, you need those, you know, uh, call it contracts. No, but what's important about those contracts is the conversations that need to happen. You can have a contract and not uh, and not have that collaboration. Right. So the idea is is not about the artifact. It's about, you know, getting people align about what they're trying to achieve. And the artifact helps with having those conversations. Um, another one is, how would you stop your company creating an automation team? I am assuming this is an anti-pattern. How do we convince managers to do this better? Oof, that's, a, that's a tough one. Uh, so without knowing the context, it's really hard to know if that's the right way to go or not to be honest um you need however to under you need to understand why it's being created what is the problem or the need that is being that they are trying to solve by acting on the structure right or by acting on how people you know the hierarchy of how we organize right is it uh you know we don't have enough resources and we need to create, you know, we have to pull them so that we can get better performance, right? If that's the case, how do we make sure that that doesn't affect, yeah? Oh, automation test, uh, automating testing, okay. Uh, again, that's another conversation, like what are you trying to, <laughs> what are you trying to solve? Is it a quality problem that you're trying to solve, right? Uh, it's very simple, man, like if you, this is a conversation is around whether quality should be everyone's business or not, 
right? And there, if there is no alignment around that, because you can have an, a, a, a quality assistance or quality assurance team that in itself is not the one writing the test, but helping everyone else write the test and leveling up people to in order to gain that skill and to actually be more proficient at finding you know, and, and upholding quality, right? So that is still a team that has a purpose and has, but the way that it behaves or uh, interacts with the rest takes more into consideration what the, uh, what the outcome of their actions is, right? If they become the, one, the only ones that write tests, then eventually they'll become a bottleneck. Yeah, so all these things are, are part of that conversation. So it really it really depends. Um, and there's no silver bullet for, for the kind of uh, approach, let's say, to, to solve something like this. Thank so, you very much, Jose. Thank you, uh, Alison, and happy to be here. And I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>